your Bibles this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the passage has been read to you already. This is our continuing, our verse-by-verse study of this letter by the Apostle Paul to the church that is at Corinth. It is a letter in which Paul deals with numerous problems that face, our, face this particular church. I think you'll find this to be a helpful study this morning. Uh, I, I told you last week and showed you last week that the issue in the first um, uh, four chapters, I mentioned this to you last time, four chapters all deal with uh, divisions in the church. It starts back in chapter 1, verse 10. And it goes all the way to the middle of chapter 4. That's just one of the problems. There's just a lack of unity in the church. And it's uh, as because of the influence of worldly wisdom into the church. They are very much influenced by their culture, the Greek culture, uh, elevated human wisdom. And there was always this effort, it seemed, in the early, early verses of chapter 1 and 2, this effort to mix the two, to mix it in with Christianity. But as I mentioned to you last week, the greatest cause for the disharmony and the disunity in the Corinthian church was not because, just because they liked different teachers and preferred different teachers. It was because of their spiritual immaturity. And I showed you that last time in verses 1 through 3. And including even four, because that's always the problem, folks, for problems in a church. Uh, I'm not talking about fundamental doctrinal issues. Those are serious, and there should be division over those things at times. But I'm just talking about preferences and differences of opinion about things. And the reason that there are actions and reactions that cause division is because of the immaturity of those within the church. A mature congregation knows how to discern the difference between something that really matters and something that's secondary and how to give preference to others and how to seek to preserve unity in the body. That's a mature congregation. That's a mature believer. In chapter, one, uh, chapter 3, verse 1, he calls them fleshly. Uh, I wanted to speak to you as spiritual men, but I had to talk to you like men of the flesh men who were controlled by their flesh, men who were carnal, as infants in Christ, babies in Christ, baby Christians. And this is in the past tense. He's talking about when he was there five years ago in 50 AD. It's now 55 AD. He was there five years earlier. He said, when I came to you, I wanted to speak to you, um, you know, as spiritual men, but you were very fleshly. You were a babes, you were infants in Christ. I had to give you milk to drink, verse 2. Could not give you solid food. I could not give you the deeper things of God's word. You had no appetite for that. You could not digest that. You were immature. You were baby, babes in Christ. And folks, it's okay to be a babe in Christ when you're a baby, when you first come to Christ. But now five years have passed, and notice what he says. For you were not able to receive it, past tense. Indeed, verse 2, even now you are not able. That's their problem. They're still spiritually immature. For you are still, verse 3, fleshly. You are still controlled by your flesh. I told you last time, reminder, that when we become a believer, the the flesh is not totally eradicated. We still have to deal with the flesh, but we have now the spirit. The flesh no longer dominates us unless we want it to. Before, we had no choice, but now as a Christian, I have that choice, and every decision I make, and every attitude and action I carry out, I have that choice. I never had that choice as a natural man. But now as a spiritual man, as one who is indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, I can be filled with the Spirit. I can yield to the Spirit of God. I can walk in the Spirit. That is something that is true for every single believer. They were making the decision, the choice to walk in the flesh. And they were still walking in the flesh. And their problem is spiritual immaturity. And it's causing incredible um, conflict within their church. It has stunted their growth. Their sin has stunted their growth. 
And so you can't leave these verses without asking yourself, am I growing? Everyone listening to my voice, if you're a Christian, that's the question you should ask yourself, am I growing? Am I maturing in my faith? Am I becoming more conformed to the image of Christ? I, I know what it is to have setbacks. I, I was set in the hospital for eight days and I had setbacks. I didn't even feel like a Christian a lot of those moments. But the point is, the trajectory of our life is toward Christ and becoming like Christ and becoming more mature in Christ. Turn to Ephesians 4 just for a moment. I've been meditating on this passage with uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones' commentary in hand, going through and just thinking about some of the things that Martin Lloyd-Jones says uh, uh, related to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. Let me just run through this very quickly. Uh, for three chapters prior to chapter 4, you may recall in the book of Ephesians, he tells us of all the riches that we have in Christ. He tells us who we are in Christ. We have been redeemed. We have been sealed. We have the Holy Spirit. We have been chosen before the foundation of the world. He gives us all of these great truths about who we are. And then when he comes to chapter 4, he says, therefore, and therefore, means that everything, in, in, in light of everything I have just said, now something, you need to do something. Therefore is a sanctification word. Understand that. You have just read about in the first three chapters about justification. Now in chapters four and following, you are reading about sanctification. Because one through three are true, therefore, the sanctification word, therefore, goes on to say, I implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have been called. You see, some Christians never get out of chapters 1, 2, and 3. They just, re just think about those things all the time, but they never, therefore, they never proceed or continue in sanctification. Because then he goes on to say, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. Be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Something, uh, something that the Corinthians needed so desperately. They had forgotten the therefore. And they were just resting in the fact they were babes in Christ but not maturing, not showing humility, not having humility and gentleness and patience and showing tolerance for one another in love and being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. They weren't doing that. They needed to be reminded that there is one body and one spirit, just also as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. We don't, we don't make this unity God makes this unity. He brings us into his body. He unites us. He is the one that makes the unity that we enjoy. We are to preserve that unity. We are to guard our hearts from bitternesses and anger and the things that would cause division, the pride and the opposites of all the things he's just said in verse 2, and impatience instead of being patient. Intolerance instead of being intolerant of others in the body of Christ. Verse 7 says, But to each of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift, and he gave some as apostles, verse 11 says. He gave gifts in his church, a teachers and, excuse me, prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers, and their purpose is for the equipping of the saints for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which be belongs to the fullness of Christ. I, I love reading this, reminding me of what we are to be about as believers. You want to know God's will for you and I as Christians. It's right here. Therefore, that's your sanctification mandate. Therefore, You've got this rich engine, one through three. Now move out. That's what he's saying. 
till we attain, listen, verse 13, for the equipping of the saints, for the workers, to the building up of the body of Christ until we attain to the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, I read this to you last week, we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. Children are vulnerable. Children are gullible. Children eat everything on the carpet when they're crawling on it. They put everything in their mouth. That's what a child does. And they need someone to tell them, don't eat that. Because, because you're going to be tossed to and throw, to and tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men. And believe me, the cults look for immature Christians. They look for gullible Christians, people that just know enough about Jesus and God to be not enough, easily deceived to join their ranks. Craftiness and deceitful scheming. They try to get your money and they they try to sound so, appeal to your emotions and they sound so right, and they put little children on the screen, and they do all of the things that will somehow arouse you emotionally and deceive you. Don't, li- don't look at the pictures. Listen to the words. That's why you need to be taught and to be equipped to be built up so you won't be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Verse 15, but... But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. As each part matures, the church matures. I desire we be a mature church. I desire that every part be maturing to present every man mature in Christ. That is our desire as your pastors that you would be growing in maturity. That's the goal. That's why we're here. You want to know what to do during these turbulent times? Grow in your faith. Grow in Christ. Seek after Him to be more like Him that you might glorify him in the midst of a dark uh, and godless generation, that your light might shine brightly, that people might see Christ in you. That's what you want. That's what I want. That's what I desire. I know why you're here this morning. I know why you're listening this morning. You You want the same thing I want. You want to grow. You want to be fed God's word. You, you, you come to this church because you know these pastors will study it and bring it to you on Sunday morning. And it may not be delivered perfectly, but you know that there's an honest effort to deliver it to you that you might grow and mature in it. So, I need solid food. You need solid food. You need the depths of God's word. I need the depths of God's word. So we need strong and healthy. Turn back to 1 Corinthians and just go to 1.10 for a moment and I'll show you the flow of this section. In 1.10, the section we're looking at is 3, 1 through 9, but I want to show you where this section begins just as a reminder the first problem that Paul addresses in this immature church. Verse 10 says, I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you are made complete in the same mind and the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by close people, that there are quarrels among you. 
Now I mean this, that each of you is saying, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I mean, they would latch on to, who baptized me? They would latch on to, Whose teacher, which teacher do I like the best? They're operating in the flesh is the point. This is an example of their immaturity. They were letting the wisdom of the world, they said, they, they thought like this, they thought, I, like the teachers in the school of philosophy, I like their brand. I like their brand. Because these, these philosophers would come to town, I told you several months ago in the introductory of 1 Corinthians that that's what would happen in Greek culture. These philosophers would come to town with their numerous views on everything about life, the meaning of life, the purpose of life, and how we got here, and all of these things. And everybody would just sort of flock to their favorite teacher, and it became a show. This was entertainment. There were no movies. You went to listen to the philosophers. And they brought this into the church, and I like this guy's brand. I like Paul's brand. I like Apollos' brand. I like Cephas' brand. Oh, I like Christ only, or whatever. The point of that was not so much to exalt the teacher, but to exalt them. Do you understand what I'm saying? When I align myself... Did I just lose my... I got my voice back there. Um, sorry about that. When I align myself with somebody, a lot of times it's for the purpose of pride. I am of R.C. Sproul. Does R.C. Sproul get anything out of that? No, I get a lot out of that because you like, those of you who like R.C. Sproul says, wow, he... Or I'm of John MacArthur. Or, uh, or I am of Steve Lawson. Or I am of John Piper. Or all these other names out there that we all admire and appreciate. But you can, what does that, that elevates you. You know, I, I think like they think. It's pride. That's self-exaltation. That's not exalting the speaker. It exalts you because you have found a brand that is popular or a brand that is worthy of praised by others, thus you're worthy of praise, something like that. It mixes in with your pride somehow. So you must be very careful about that. And, and one of the repercussions of this kind of thinking was they were discontinuing listening to Paul. And that's dangerous. They were starting to think less of Paul. And he's an apostle. And they were starting to think, well, you know, Apollos he talks better. Apollo sounds better. Cephas actually walked with Jesus. Paul didn't. You know, and, and so Paul's words are hard to listen to. He just talks kind of rough. We try to, try to tell him to, to, to make the gospel a little more palatable to the Greek culture, but he won't do it. So that was one of the repercussions of this division, of this uh, factionism that they were developing in the church, and, and therefore I won't listen to him. I'm just going to listen to this guy. Very serious. Paul's not very pleasant to look at either. That guy's, God, guy's so much more handsome to look at. All these external things, you know. So he exposes the problem of their immaturity. And he's really been hit hard. God's wisdom is opposed to human wisdom. Don't bring that stuff into the church. Don't bring that worldly thinking into the church. Don't bring that worldly evaluation system in the church. Verse 4, I'm of Apollos, then another, I'm of Paul, another, I'm of Apollos. Are you not mere men when you start talking like that? See that in verse 4 of 3, 1 Corinthians 3? Steve Lawson, Steve Lawson tells a story. I actually read the biography of this man uh, 
Henry Ward Beecher, you may have heard of his sister, Harriet Beecher Stowe, wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. Well, her brother, Henry Ward Beecher, was a pastor in the mid-1800s. He was a very well-known pastor, a very successful pastor, a very fluid speaker as a pastor. He had a large church in New York City. People would come from all around to listen to him talk. He was very popular, very well-known, very influential. Um, tourists would come to New York City and they would make sure they made it over to Plymouth Church to listen to Henry Ward Beecher. Well, one Sunday morning, unannounced to anybody publicly, was Henry Ward Beecher was going to be out of town that Sunday. And so all these people had come with the intention to hear Henry Ward Beecher But up to the pulpit walks his lesser-known brother, Thomas Beecher. And people started to get up to leave. And Thomas noticed that. And, you know, these people were disappointed. And they'd come, and, and he stands up and he says, If you came here this morning to worship God, you will want to stay. If you came here this morning to worship man, you might want to leave. That's true. He identified the problem. They were there to worship man. And people had their eyes on man. And that's exactly what this passage is talking about. I am of Paul's party. I am of Apollos' party. I don't listen to anybody but Apollos. I don't listen to anybody but Paul. It was distracting the focus of their Christian life when aligning with human leaders. Uh, you know, these people, are, these people are to be visible for their people. They're, they're, that's, that's what you do. You stand up and you, and you talk in front of people. They're, that's how it's supposed to be. And later Paul is going to tell them, you follow my example. There's nothing wrong with that. You follow me as I follow Christ. There's nothing wrong with that. But the loyalty and the allegiance is to God alone. You don't, you follow human leaders to the extent that they are following Christ. And um, 1 Thessalonians 5 says, we are to appreciate those who diligently labor among us. There's nothing wrong to appreciate, but we do not put them on a pedestal and, and cause factions and fracturing the church. And that's what was happening and Paul says as immaturity is doing that, it's manifested in your striving and your jealousy. It's manifested in your divisions, your sinfulness. You know, so there's a competitiveness that goes on in that, and that's what we saw happening. And they weren't growing. They weren't growing. They were more focused on man and their own leaders It was kind of like the competition of my dad can beat up your dad or my car is bigger than your car or nicer than your car or my house is bigger than your, whatever. Just petty little competitive thinking like that. So this is just a reminder we must be looking to Christ. Things above, not things that are on the earth. You grow by laying aside every encumbrance that so easily entangles you and fix your eyes on Jesus. That is, that is the main point that he is making in these verses that we're looking at this morning. And I, I want to tell you something. As more and more churches are becoming apostate, as more and more churches are, are defecting from the truth, and think less of Christ. And when they start thinking less of Christ, what they do, they start making more of their ministers. They, they start talking about the Father, Most Holy, Right Reverend, whatever his name is, has three doctorate degrees, and da-da-da-da-da-da. You know, they, they elevate them because they're not elevating Christ. When Christ is elevated... You think very little about the minister. So, these are things that 
He's giving the antidote here in these verses 5 through 9. He's giving the antidote for their division. Get your eyes back on God. Because that's repeated over and over in these 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. It's repeated over and over in these five verses. Look at the argument. It begins in verse 5. What then is Apollos and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. So he says, doesn't say who is Apollos, who is Paul. He doesn't say who. He says what? What? Basically, what then? What then is Paul? What then is Apollos? How should you regard Paul? How should you regard Apollos? He's not saying who is Paul? Who is Apollos? He's not focusing on their personality. He's not focusing on their style. He's focusing on their function. What are they there for? What are why are they in your life? What then? Rhetorical questions. He then answers, he says, servants through whom you believe. They, they're we servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it, the word actually had the meaning of busboy. You think of a busboy, somebody that, that waits on a table or cleans up the tables. You, you, why would you want to exalt a busboy? You don't exalt human instruments. That's his point there. You, 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 know, you don't make statues to busboys. And we don't exalt ministers either. 2 Corinthians calls ministers, Paul calls them jars of clay, clay pots, pots for refuse, pots that are clay, but they contain a very valuable message. They're vessels that carry the message. They're, they're, they're like waiters. They, they don't cook the food. They just deliver it. They don't get credit for cooking it. They may try. A lot of them try. But the true minister is one who brings the truth. He's just, he's just the waiter. He just delivers it. Didn't cook it. He's just the busboy. You don't, you don't if, you, if you have an artist that painted a picture that you really like, you don't honor him by taking a picture of his brush, do you? No. It's because that's the instrument. You don't highlight the instrument. Paul is simply saying, what is Apollos? What then is Apollos? What then is Paul? They're instruments. Instruments in the Redeemer's hands. They're just human instruments. Notice the word through, the preposition through, through whom you believed. You believed. They were agents through whom you believed. And it looks back at their conversion. God used them to save you. But it's God who saved you. That God used them. God has ordained it that he will be sovereign in your salvation and even the means by which you hear the message. And that's what he means at the end of that verse. Gave opportunity to each one. God put me in Corinth. God put Apollos in Corinth. He gave us opportunity in your lives. That's what that verse means. God opened that door for us to be a part of that. But we don't get the praise. We don't get the glory. We don't get anything. Um, he, gave, he just gave us the opportunity. R.C. Ryle said this, Every faithful minister must be content to be less thought of by his believing hearers in proportion as they grow in knowledge and faith and seek Christ himself more clearly. The more, in other words, he says, the more you see of Christ, the less you see the minister. He must increase, Christ must increase, I must decrease. Some pastors want the glory. Some pastors want the attention. Some pastors want the accolades. Some pastors want all the expressions of appreciation. Some pastors want you to feed their pride. I, it would be horrible for me to hear you say or anybody to say, I came to Grace Church to see Christ. I came to Grace Church looking for Jesus, but Rod Bunton got in the way. I would hate to hear that. 
I would hate to think that. I would hate to think that Charlie Greenwell got in the way. I would hate to think that any of our other elders, Doug or Ben, got in the way. We have not mastered humility, no doubt. But we should never get in the way. We're just instruments. We're just Christians like everybody else. And God's just given us an opportunity to do something that we would never want to get into the way. It's a young story told about a young pastor. You may have heard this young pastor who, who was going to give a sermon. His sermon, one of his first sermons early in his ministry, and he was so confident about it. He had studied so hard. He had done all the work. He had parsed every verb. He'd done everything preparing to stand in that pulpit and to preach that sermon that he had prepared. He was very confident about it. He stood up there, and he started to talk, and it just flopped. It just flopped, totally flopped. That uh, 40 minute sermon turned into five minutes. He couldn't get, he couldn't, he just couldn't get it together. I've been there, I know what that's like. But he couldn't get it together. And he very humbly and broken walked down from that pulpit. And after the service, an elderly gentleman came up to him and said, Son, if you had walked in that pulpit the way up into that pulpit, the way you walk down from that pulpit, I bet there would have been a different outcome. Uh, Wow, that's a good point. That's a good point. Just instruments. I'm not trying to impress anybody. Notice verse 6, I planted, he gives an analogy here, he says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. Farming, very common, agricultural uh, analogy here, growing food. Two faithful men, Apollos and Paul, I, Paul, Apollos, I planted, Apollos watered. Differing ministries, notice Paul says, I planted, he was the church planter, he came to Corinth, you can read it in Acts 18, he comes to Corinth, he goes into the marketplace, he brings, a pe- people come to listen to Paul speak, Paul brings some people to Christ and he starts the church at Corinth. And he stayed there for 18 months cultivating that soil. But he planted the church in Corinth. That was what he did. He did that in 50 AD. He was there for about 18 months, and then the man that came after him was Apollos. You can read about Apollos in Acts 18 as well. Apollos was a great preacher. Apollos was an eloquent preacher. Apollos was a man who was mighty in the Scriptures. We're told all these things about Apollos. I really think the conflict here is Paul and Apollos. Not that they were having a conflict, but he was the... They were the issue. They were the issue. The, plant, the, the, the founding pastor and the guy that came after him. But he was highly regarded and probably a better preacher in some ways than golden tongue is what some people have said he had, the terms that are used there. But he was a master preacher of the word of God. And he came in behind Paul and, uh, as the overseer of that flock. And, you know, he, the church is like a field. And, and he, he watered what was planted. But neither one of them can say, regardless of how hard they might have worked and labored in that field, they cannot say that they caused the growth. That's what he says at the end of verse 6. God was causing the growth. God is the one who gets the glory. They're just instruments. But God was causing the glory. He is the one that made the seed to germinate. He is the one that brings forth fruit. He is the Lord of the harvest. They can, no matter how hard you toil, you cannot bring life. You cannot. You cannot save anybody. And so, it's hard work. It was hard work they both did. So God is the one that does it. And unless you recognize that, if you're looking to men to mature you, if you're looking to men to, you know, it's God who causes your growth. We must keep our eyes on him. Here's a couple of implications. Notice in verses 7 and 8. So then, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth says that statement again at the end, God who causes the growth. 
Anyone can water. Anyone can plant. All of you are called to plant. All of you are called to water. All of us as Christians. But we all recognize that only God can save. You can sometimes fall into the trap of thinking that we have to get it done ourselves. We sometimes fall in the trap of thinking and we get this mindset going on that, and we start pushing hard into people's lives. We start pushing very hard into people's lives to bring about some kind of result and it turns into manipulation because only God can do and bring about true lasting results. The change that you and I desire, we might see their need, we might see the problem, and we might see they need Christ, and yet, unless they see that, that's what we pray, God help them see that. We can, we can make superficial conversions, we can do that, that happens all the time. We can get people aroused up emotionally, we can get people to pray a prayer or to walk an aisle, and then we can get them to pray, and then we can tell them they're saved, and we can, it's all super, it can all be, all be superficial. It can all be superficial. God has not done the lasting work if we think we're the ones that did it. If we did it, it's not lasting. And so, so no pastor is above anyone else and that sense and uh, they all preach the same message they all had the same mission to build up this church, to mature this church, to, so that God would cause it to grow, that God would use them to cause it to grow. He says in verse uh, 8 that he says, Now he who plants and he who waters are one. Notice they are one. They're not divided. They're not competitive with each other. See that in verse 8? Uh, but each one will receive his reward. God rewards us individually. God will give reward for your labor. You're one in the sense of the mission. You're one in the sense of what you want to see happen. There's a unity there, but in terms of your labor, there's an individual side to it because God rewards individually. We'll see more of that next time, but that's what he's saying. It's, it's foolish for you to be competitive among these guys who don't compete with themselves, each other. It's foolish for you to try to give them laurels of, and reward because they're going to get that from God one day. They don't need that from you. God's going to reward them. And it's not, reward is not based on the results. Reward is based on the labor, what you did not on the results of it. The results are up to God. But it's the labor. And we'll see that next time. There was a, a missionary we read about, uh, went to India, was there for many, many, many years, saw one convert, one convert his whole life. And yet it's not the results that he would be rewarded for, but it was all those years of faithful laboring Look at verse 9. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. And he's just driving this home, setting it up for the next section of, of rewards. But you're the field. You belong to God. We're God's fellow workers. It's all about God. God, 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 all over that verse. Reminding them where their focus should be. Let me take you to John 3, and I'll close with this this morning, because here's a great example, a great illustration of what we've just seen in John chapter 3, verse 22. John chapter 3, verse 22. I want to close with this. Uh, uh, this is a great illustration to, um, to this whole point that the focus is on God. This is John the Baptist. John the Baptist is called the greatest man that ever lived. If he's the greatest man that ever lived, then he was the greatest servant who ever lived. He was the greatest servant of God who ever lived. In John chapter 3, verse 22, John the Baptist, as you recall, was the forerunner of Christ. John the Baptist was a, a, a voice crying in the wilderness. He dressed in camel's hair. He had a leather belt. He ate locusts and wild honey. He was the last of the prophets. Uh, he came after a period of 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So he's the first prophet to speak for 400 years. And he comes with an incredible message. The Messiah is coming. The Messiah is here. Make ready the way for the Lord. That was his purpose, to announce the coming of the Messiah, to get ready, get your heart ready, repent. And so, 
this passage shows us the importance of a teacher fading away so that Christ can become everything. Because John, John the Baptist was extremely popular. Masses of people would go out into the wilderness to hear him speak, to be baptized by John. He was incredibly popular. And people would come down to the river to be baptized. Even the Messiah came to the river to be baptized by John. But John's message was always, I'm a voice crying in the wilderness. I'm telling people to get ready. Now, there is a period of time when the two ministries of Christ and John the Baptist overlap. And that's the scene we see here. It's right before John goes to prison. The ministry, Christ is ministering. John the Baptist is ministering. John the Baptist is fine with that. John the, John the Baptist's disciples are not fine with that. They're jealous. They're jealous for John. Notice what they say. They, they're getting jealous. And notice in verse 22, after these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he was spending time with them and baptizing. John also was baptizing near Salem because there was much water there. Just tells you that you need much water to be baptized correctly. Just let's so throw that in. And people were coming and were being baptized. So you see two ministries going on there. For John had not been thrown into prison. Therefore, there arose a discussion on the part of John's disciples with a Jew about purification, baptism. That's what they're talking about with this person. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. Notice jealousy doesn't give a name, doesn't say Jesus doesn't say the Messiah. He's just, he, he, he's just uh, they're holding on to John so much, uh, and they're fighting so much for John's superiority over Jesus that they just say, he who was with you beyond the Jordan. They don't even say his name, and, they, and that's just how jealousy talks. And then he, he's baptizing all that comes to him. That's an exaggeration, but that's what they say. There's envy. They don't say his name, and they're jealous for John the Baptist. And here's the point. How does John feel about the masses shifting to Jesus? Verse 27, John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. Um, Paul said that too. You know, what, what do you have that you got yourself? And then he says, It's not about me. This is about heaven. And what heaven has deposited into my hands. That's what this is about. Verse 28. That's what, that's what we just saw in 1 Corinthians 3. It's God gave us that opportunity. Notice in verse 28. You yourselves are my witnesses, John says, that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. He says, you've been my followers. You've been loyal to me. Uh, I'm not the Christ. I was sent ahead of the Christ. Every minister needs to say that. I am not the Christ. It's not about me. It's about him. That's what John is doing. It's about him. The faster I fade, the better. The faster I get out of the picture, the better. And so, verse 29 says, He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. So he gives this incredible illustration about the fact that I'm, a bri I'm not the bridegroom. Uh, I'm the best man. I'm the best man at this wedding. Uh, I, the bride is not for me. The bride is for the bridegroom, the Messiah. The, bri the best man at the wedding is, had the most important job, really, of anybody in the wedding party except the bride and groom. But he, his job in the wedding party was to, or as part of the wedding, was to take care of all the details for the week-long event that the wedding was. His, his job in the wedding was to take care of all the details and the food and all the things that caterers would do. You, this is what this guy would do. He'd be responsible for all of that, organizing all of that, making sure everything is coordinated. And then the best man would also communicate with the bride on behalf of the bridegroom. And then when the wedding day came, the best man would be the one who would present the bride to the bridegroom. And that's what John is saying. He says, I want to connect the bride to the bridegroom. You follow me? That's all I want to do. I want to connect. It's not a competitiveness with him. It's a joy for him 
to have this role of connecting the bride to the bridegroom. I just want to take sinners to Jesus. That's what that illustration is saying. I just want to take sinners to Jesus. And when that is done, I rejoice. And then that's why he says, he says, you guys are jealous because Jesus has more people than I do. But listen, that's my task. In fact, that's why he says in verse 30, he must increase. Excuse me, I must decrease, but he must increase. And, and, and the operative word in that verse is the word must. It must happen. I must fade and he must become more and more apparent and visible. I must be like a retreating shadow. When the wedding's over, you don't remember the best man. You just know who the bride and bridegroom are. That's what John says. That's what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 3. It's not about us. It's not about the instruments. It's about Christ. We must decrease. He must increase. If you're here this morning, you know Christ. I just pray, and that's a prayer, a prayer of all the elders and all the people of our church. We would want you to know Jesus Christ. We would, want you, we would want to bring you to Christ. We would want to point you to Christ. Because there's no other name under heaven by which men must be saved. So we'd invite you to do that this morning. If you're listening to us on live stream and you don't attend a church anywhere, we certainly invite you to come to this church and be a part of this church. Because we exalt Christ and there's no other name under heaven that can save you, that has the power to save you, to forgive you of your sin, and to make you right with God that you can spend eternity with him. John the Baptist wanted to do that. Paul wanted to do that. They were just instruments. And that's all we are here is just an instrument because we want to exalt our Savior. Let me pray. Father, thank you for this time we've had this morning. Thank you, God, for the truths that we've seen in, in the passage in 1 Corinthians. God, I pray that all of us would look at our own hearts. It's so easy to get spiritual pride. It's so easy, God, to think much of us and, not, and less of Christ. May we keep our eyes on Him. May we, our, our eyes be fixed on Him. And may we look to Him. I pray if there's any listening this morning that need to know the Savior and don't know Him, that you would work in their heart and show them their need. They need salvation in Jesus. We praise you and thank you for this time this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.